All right, welcome to podcast 5.2. We're going to start talking about acids and bases a little bit more specifically. So again, 5.2, second in the series, and this is Yes Chemistry. Uh, the first thing we need to know about acids and bases is that all acids and bases are solutions. When we think about acids and bases, we usually think, oh, it's just a liquid, but they're, they're solutions of ions, and we're going to be looking at how they differ based on their ions. And there are different theories about explaining acid and base theory. The first one that we're going to look at is called the Arrhenius theory, and this is the same guy who did net ionic equations back in chapter 3. And then the second one we're going to add is called the Bronsted-Lowry theory of acids and bases, and these guys were also Swedish, and they were worked after Arrhenius and they came up with an addendum to what he said. So the first thing that Arrhenius said was that acids are any compound uh, that produce hydrogen ions, H plus ions, in solution. So if I were to take a compound, drop it into some water, uh, and it gave off hydrogen ions, then he would define that as an acid. And the type of solution we're talking about, these have to be aqueous solutions. So I cannot just add a chemical to any solvent, and if I get hydrogen, it's an acid. No, it has to be in a water solvent. Bases, then, are the opposite of acids. That means that bases are compounds that produce... Sorry, my handwriting is terrible today. That produce... The opposite of hydro, uh, hydrogen ions are the hydroxide ions that produce OH- ions in solution. And again, these are in aqueous solutions. So this is a very simple definition. This is what you see in biology. Acids have hydrogen, bases have hydroxide. Bronsted and Lowry came along and said, well, all acids don't act quite like that. There are some exceptions to that rule. And I'm going to show you an exception in just a minute. But the first thing that they said, these acids are compounds or chemicals that donate or give away a proton. And the proton is the hydrogen ion. And it's when you think about it, it makes sense. Hydrogen ions are a proton and an electron, right? But when I ionize, all I have left over is this positive proton, the hydrogen nucleus. So when we're talking about giving away protons, we're still talking about hydrogen ions. So this is still similar uh, to the Arrhenius definition. What the difference is, is in the bases. If acids are compounds that donate protons or give protons away, bases are compounds that accept protons or that uh, pick up protons, accept protons. And still, these protons are hydrogen ions. And there's a classic example of this. A very common cleaner is ammonia, NH3. Okay. When we take ammonia and when we mix it with water, we get a very uh, strange chemical reaction in where the water will actually give a hydrogen ion to the ammonia. So when ammonia, NH3, picks up another hydrogen, we now have formed the ammonium ion, NH4+, and then we have hydroxide left over. So notice that hydroxide is still part of the base that's being produced, but it's not acting as the base. So looking over here at your reactants, the acid is the donating the proton, so the water becomes the acid in this sense, and then the ammonia acts as the base. And this is very, very common in chemistry, and we're going to see these a lot more than just this one example. But this is how Bronsted-Lowry acids work. This is a good example. We can talk about acids and bases in terms of strength. And when I'm talking about strength, I am not talking about concentration. I can have a very concentrated solution of a weak acid, um, but it, it has nothing to do with the actual concentration. And what strength means is that strong, strong acids and bases they dissociate or they ionize 100% in water. So, for example, if I took HCl, hydrochloric acid, this is a strong acid. If I add this to water, I have 100% hydrogen and 100% chlorine ions. I, there is no more hydrochloric, hydrogen chloride as we know it. On the other hand, though, if I take a weak acid like acetic acid, uh, CH2H3O2, if I were to put this into water, yeah, some hydrogen would ionize, some of the acetate would ionize, 
but I would still also have the acetic acid molecule. So this is less than 100% for the weak ones. And there's a table in your notes with the strong acids and bases. And there's a little note at the bottom that says, if you know the strong ones, you know the weak ones. And what that means is that if you know your 12 strong acids and bases, then everything else is a weak acid or a base. Also notice that the acids and bases listed are arrhenius acids and bases. Uh, these are the ones that you need to have memorized. So the six strong acids, uh, hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid, and then you've got sulfuric, nitric, and perchloric. And then the, uh, the, the bases are all uh, group one and group two. And there's a pattern. You've got sodium, potassium, and lithium. And those run down period one. And then you drop over to period two, or I'm sorry, they run down group one and you jump over to group two and you pick up calcium, strontium, and barium hydroxide. And it looks like a tetris shape. So the bases kind of go in this kind of lightning bolt shape. Uh, so the bases are pretty easy to memorize. Acids, you might need to uh, study a little bit more to get them to stick, but you must know your strong acids and bases. Uh, concentration of acid and base is always given in molarity. And when we're talking about concentrated acid and base, concentrated means we are approaching or we've reached, we're approaching maximum molarity. I cannot increase the concentration of this acid or this base anymore. Uh, so for example, hydrochloric acid, its concentrated form is usually about 16 and a half molar. I cannot get a higher molarity than that with hydrochloric acid in general. You can buy more concentrated, but this is the one that's uh, most generally used. This is so, so corrosive that it's not really used that often even at that concentration. So what we need to look at how to do is are called dilutions, where we take the strength of an acid or a base or any solution and we drop it by adding water, we add solvent. Now dilutions work because the total moles of solute are not changing. All we're doing is we're changing the volume of solution by adding water. And we can rearrange to solve for any variable and the volume in the reaction needs to be the same the volume in the calculation. When you're doing a dilution, you're going to use this formula. Dilutions are done by M1V1 is equal to M2V2. And obviously the M is the molarity and the V is the volume, but the first one, this side, the M1V1, this is the initial or what you start with. And then M2V2 is the final or your desired, what you want to make in the end. Okay, so these are very simple calculations because it's just a ratio and I can rearrange this to solve for anything. What this last one means is units of volume need to be the same. Volume can be done in liters, it can be done in milliliters, it can be done in anything as long as the V's stay the same. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. So, what volume of water is needed to dilute 250 milliliters of 18 molar HCl to 1 molar? So, the word dilute is right in here, so we know we're going to be using M1V1 equals M2V2. And what we need to do is we need to assign the variables, okay? Uh, we need to look at the initial concentration, right? The initial is going to be the higher concentration, and this keyword of tells me that this is what I'm starting with. So our initial concentration, M1, is 18 molar. The volume of that is the one tagged with it. So the 250 milliliters goes right here with V1. And then M2 is what we are diluting to. So 2 is inferring that we're going from 18 to 1 molar. And so this is going to serve as our M2 variable. That means we need to solve for V2. And you can know it's V2 because it's asking what volume of water. So if I rearrange this, solving for V2, I end up with M1V1 over M2 equals V2. And then all you need to do is plug in your variables and calculate. Now, the way I learned this is to change all your volumes to liters. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. But you can keep it in milliliters. It's not that big of a deal. It's the same answer both ways. So M1, my initial molarity is 18 up here, 18M. And that is multiplied by your volume right here. So 250 milliliters, divide that by 1,000, gives me 0 0.250 milliliters. Or I'm sorry, not milliliters anymore, liters. And all of that gets divided by my new molarity right here of 1. Okay. Notice that when we set this up, our concentrations cancel each other out. And after you multiply everything through, you end up with 4.5. The only unit you have left over is liters. And what is this of? Well, my solution is HCl solution. 
So that's the substance that gets tagged on the end here. So what this is saying is that to do this dilution, I need to add four and a half liters of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, not HCl, four and a half liters of water. I'm um, sorry about that. We need to pay attention to what we're asking for. So four and a half liters of water will dilute 18 molar HCl, 250 milliliters of 18 molar HCl to one molar. Another example, what is the final volume when 25 milliliters of 16 molar HNO3 solution is diluted to 2 molar? So again, we're talking about dilutions, obviously. So this is M1V1 equals M2V2. Uh, assigning your concentrations or assigning your variables. My initial molarity here, my higher one, is M1. My volume of this concentration is back up here with a 25, so this is V1. And then my new molarity is right here, M2. So we're solving again for V2 because I'm asking for a final volume, and I'm going to come back to this in just a minute. So again, rearranging M1 V1 over M2 equals V2. Plug in your variables. My initial molarity is 16 molar. That gets multiplied by the volume. Again, I'm going to change it to liters. So 0 0.025 liters. And this, again, is divided by 2. Okay, concentrations cancel. And when we're done, after you carry out your calculation, we end up with 0 0.2 liters. Normally we would stop here, but again, look back at the question. It's asking for the final volume. This is telling me the amount of water to, I need to dilute. Okay, so if I'm adding 200 milliliters or 0.2 liters, I have to add it to this initial volume right here. This doesn't just disappear. So what we do is we add this, so 2 liter, or 0 0.2 liters is equal to 200 milliliters. That gets added to the initial volume of 25. So my final answer is 225 milliliters is my total volume of solution after the dilution. So you have to pay attention to what the question is actually saying. Uh, example three, what molarity will be achieved if 500 milliliters of water is added to 175 milliliters of 6.3 molar strontium nitrate solution? Now notice that solutions do not have to be acid or base to dilute. It can be any solution. Uh, so M1V1, okay, using your general equation, solve for, uh, let's see, what do we need to solve for? What molarity, so I'm looking for a molarity, is achieved if 500 milliliters of water is added to 175 milliliters, 6.3 molars. So this is M1, and this is the volume that goes with that. Now with V2, you have to be careful again because I'm adding 500 milliliters to 175 milliliters. So volume two is not 500 because that's not my final volume. My final volume is 500 that I'm adding plus 175. So V2 is 675 milliliters, okay? You have to really be careful about the information here. And again, I'm looking for M2, question mark, M2. So if we rearrange this, we have M1V1 over V2 will give me M2, and then fill in your variables. So 6.3 molar times my initial volume, 175 or 0.175 liters, and that is divided then by my final volume of 675, 0.675 liters. This time liters cancel out and your final answer ends up at 1.63 molar. And so this solution is dropped in molarity and that's one way you can check yourself. Your initial concentration should be higher than your final concentration in the end. I'd like you to add one more example. We can also go backwards. What we did is we diluted 125 milliliters of solution to a final volume of 500 milliliters, and your final molarity was then 1.25. Knowing this, what was the initial concentration? Okay, so if we did a dilution, that means we had to use M1V1 at some point, and we can look at it to go backwards. Uh, this would be V1, our initial volume, and we diluted it to a final volume of 500 and then your final molarity was 1.25. So this time we're looking for M1. So we end up with M2V2 over V1 is equal to M1. And then fill in your variables yet again. Uh, M2 was 1.25. Uh, V2 was 500 given here at the end, so 0.5. And V1, 125, 0.125. And when you calculate this out, this works out to a molarity of 5 
So we can also use this to go backwards to figure out what we started with. Uh, so hopefully this is pretty easy. I do not have a practice worksheet for this one, so I'll take a look at the textbook and then take a look at homework number two.